Our annual Exploring Space lectures are always some of the most anticipated events of the year. They're great opportunities for us to share with you the incredible science being conducted around the world to increase our understanding of our universe. This year's series will celebrate the diversity of techniques we use to explore the universe. The Exploring Space Lecture series is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, Aerojet Rocketdyne and the United Launch Alliance, companies that have been instrumental in launching, propelling, and landing many spacecraft that have explored our solar system. Representatives of these organizations are in the audience. Please join me in thanking them for their generosity in supporting this great evening. Some of you just uh, got to ask some questions of the speaker, and we are so delighted to have Dr. Mark Chung with us here tonight. He is a senior staff physicist at the Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Center. As senior staff physicist, he is part of NASA's Frontier Development Lab, where he uh, is a heliophysics mentor. He's been a visiting scholar at Stanford University and currently serves as the principal investigator for the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly, one of the three instruments on board NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. The Solar Dynamics Obs Observatory in high orbit above Earth has been monitoring the sun for a decade to better understand uh, the cause of solar flares and coronal mass ejections, which can affect commerce, communications, and power grids on the Earth. Whenever I would go out and talk to school kids, I would say, imagine, try to imagine, no matter how hard it is, that something could happen and your cell phone would stop working. So the more we know about the sun and its behavior, the better we can predict and protect ourselves from these events that will occur. So today, on the 10th anniversary of the launch of the Solar Dynamics Observatory, Dr. Chung will talk to us about how it and other science missions from NASA and the National Science Foundation are revealing the mysteries of the sun. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Chung. Thank you, Alex. All right. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to the Rain Space Museum and the sponsors for this opportunity to tell you something about the sun. And this lecture is titled The Sun in a New Light. And I think it will be self-explanatory what we mean by that. So let's embark on a journey. Uh, on days like this, you would rather be at the beach, except when you're here for the lecture. <laughs> but some of us, at least in California, take the sun for granted. It rises at predictable times. It sets, gives us warmth, tans our skin. It's a pretty reliable, avuncular, a stellar companion. And most of us, we go about our daily lives not thinking about it so much because it is so predictable. And we think we know the sun. But do we really? Well, when we can see the sun in all its glory, uh, we will learn much more about ourselves and our place in the universe. But let's just start with the basics. There are certain times when we're lucky enough that we see a, an astronomical miracle that is a total solar eclipse. May I ask you uh, how many of you managed uh, to get a glimpse of the total solar eclipse in 2017? Wow. that's. Uh, at least half of you here. Uh, how many of you think that it was worth the five hour drive, the 10 hour drive? <laughs> Basically, the, almost the same set of hands. And I would agree. This is what I tell people. Uh, a, an annular eclipse is beautiful. You see a ring. A 
partial eclipse is not bad. You get to see the moon in front of the sun. But a total eclipse is a completely different thing. Uh, it's a life-changing experience. The reason it is so different is that the light from the disk of the sun is about a million times brighter than the light we see from the solar corona that we can see when the moon completely obscures the solar disk. And it is, at least on Earth, unless if you have a special telescope, only during these times that you can see how structured, how wonderful it is um, with all these striations that is the solar corona. We find that this is not a boring, uh, spherically symmetric structure at all, uh, but it is different from eclipse to eclipse. And beyond that, the experience one gets from anticipating the totality, from seeing the surroundings change from the normal green, the normal colors in the field, to some metallic indigo, uh, that is unforgettable. So when you get another chance in a few years, when we have another total solar eclipse crossing the US, I urge you, uh, don't be like some of the citizens of Portland who said, oh, the eclipse is coming to us, so why drive that uh, 20 miles south to see totality? I urge you to make that extra effort and experience it for yourself. So this is usually what we see, uh, but we're advised not to look at the sun directly. But suppose you have the right filters, then th this is the, the solar disk. Sometimes there are blemishes, uh, dark spots, very faint dark spots that you can see here. And if we stare at it for a day or so, we realize that the sun is rotating, the spots are moving, but still, it doesn't look that spectacular. But if we can get out of the Earth's atmosphere, get above, and image the sun in other light, then we see that during the exact same time period, something extraordinary is happening. Uh, the solar corona here is pinching off to create a coronal mass ejection and a solar flare. And we would like to know what these are. But in order to do so, let's have a basic introduction to the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, until a few years ago, most of what we learn about the universe is from measuring electromagnetic waves arriving at the Earth or from energetic particles that are hurtling through space and near the speed of Right. But now we have also gravitational waves from LIGO, and that's opened an entire new window. But still, most of what we know is from the electromagnetic spectrum. And these are wiggles uh, of the electric field and magnetic field in space. And these waves can have different wavelengths. You can have radio waves that are very long wavelength, maybe the size of buildings. You can have all the way to gamma rays which are even smaller or comparable to the size of atomic nuclei. And then there's everything in between. And then there's the visible spectrum that we see. And actually, the sun emits in all these wavelengths. And observations of the sun in all these wavelengths, different wavelengths, tell us something a little different. And so when we see the sun in the different wavelengths in the different new lights, uh, we learn so much more. This is back to a visible image of the sun, now uh, near solar maximum so that there are more sunspots and bigger sunspots. And people have been drawing sunspots for a long time and continue to do so, even though we can uh, capture regularly uh, photographs of sunspots. And this is a beautiful sunspot drawing from Mount Wilson Observatory near Los Angeles. Uh, 
bless them for uh, doing this work every day. It's so pretty. This is one of the largest sunspots. This was the largest sunspot in the last 30 years. Well, how large? It's this large. So sunspots are planet-sized objects, holes that seem to be punched into the surface of the sun. And it used to be that uh, some scientists considered that uh, these were openings into, into the sun. Uh, and you can peek uh, and see uh, living beings underneath. But that is not the case. And people have been drawing sunspots and counting sunspots for hundreds of years. For example, Galileo reported that the sunspots uh, were traversing the surface of the sun. And other, other natural philosophers, they counted sunspots and they found that there is a, an approximate 11 year cycle that the number of sunspots on the sun on any given day waxes and wanes with an 11 year period. And in the modern space age, when we can measure the emission from the sun, from the sun's corona, which is plasma at millions of Kelvin, um, we see also that the brightness there varies with the same periodicity. But what are these sunspots? And do they affect us? So it was in 1859 when Richard Carrington and Richard Hodgson in England, they had their telescopes on one of these sunspots and what Richard Carrington saw was a flare. Uh, he saw these bright ribbons uh, light up on the surface of the sun in between spots and, and he was very excited. He didn't know what it was but he reported it. And then uh, at around the same time, actually even before, a few days before his observations and after, people were reporting aurora. And not just the aurora in the northern or southern regions. Uh, people reported auroral sightings in large swaths of the globe in places at low latitudes that you would not typically see aurora. So this is a graph, a plot from a, a recent paper uh, where they, they went through more historical records and in the red dots are uh, the new, new uh, they added these auroral sightings to, to what people knew were, were places where people reported aurora uh, pretty soon after Carrington saw the flare. And in addition to seeing these aurora where you usually wouldn't see them, uh, people were also uh, measuring magnetic fields on Earth at the time, they had magnetometers, a legacy of Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, they found huge disturbances, much more than typically you would get at, at around the same time. And, and so it was, it was very strange. And I think at that time, it would have been, uh, it would been, have frowned upon if someone told you that whatever happened on the sun would affect the magnetic fields on Earth, um, but that is common knowledge today. And the scientists, we transformed our view of the sun is George Ellery Hale. 101 years ago, he used the newly discovered quantum mechanics, the so-called Seyman effect, uh, which says that some, some energy levels in atoms uh, split when the atom is in a magnetic field, in a strong magnetic field. So when usually with these energy transitions, uh, you might have some absorption lines in the solar spectrum, but then these absorption lines, each one absorption line will suddenly split in the presence of a magnetic field. And from the distance in the splitting, uh, he inferred that there were very, very strong magnetic fields in sunspots. And 
and that suddenly gave us a hint that there might be an agent for how the sun might be able to disturb uh, its surroundings, including on Earth. So how does one actually do this? So imagine you're at a movie theater uh, watching some 3D movie, and they give you these glasses. Uh, and so, so the, the ones where the, the image doesn't split when you tilt your head, uh, what, it, what it does is that um, one lens would let light that is spinning clockwise through to your eyes, and the other lens would let light spinning counterclockwise through your eyes, and then your, your brain would, uh, your, your visual cortex system would add the images together, and because of parallax, you get that 3D image. Okay, so now imagine, this is what I mean. So imagine you did that. You measured the left spinning light from the sun. You measure the right spinning light from the sun. Instead of adding, you subtract. So these almost look like identical images. Um, but if you did it at certain specific wavelengths uh, using using the properties of atoms, what you find is that when you subtract these two images together, it looks like this. This is a magnetic map of the surface of the sun. S uh, so by using these techniques, we can regularly observe magnetic fields on the sun, and what we find is that the magnetic fields are not just concentrated in sunspots, but also in the peripheries of sunspots, and even in the quiet regions away from the sunspots. Uh, the magnetic field is everywhere. But the thing about magnetic field is that uh, magnetic fields have no end. Uh, from your I don't know, high school physics, the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, it's solenoidal. It has no end, so, so what comes up must eventually go down. Uh, so you have magnetic fields that are coming out of the sun and into the sun, and this is denoted by the white and black polarities here. So that's interesting. The sunspot groups are big magnetic loops. And when you observe a movie, of these magnetic maps, you see, first of all, that the sun is rotating. It rotates about once a month, depends on where you're uh, tracking. But you also see that there are flows streaming out of sunspots with carrying the magnetic field. Uh, there is a network pattern uh, that is called the supergranulation that is dispersing the magnetic field from the sunspot regions. And eventually, uh, some of this magnetic flux cancel with each other. And others get affected to the polar regions of the sun. And then people have theories about how the sun reverses its polarity every 11 years so that the magnetic cycle is not 11 years, but it takes two sunspot cycles for the magnetic field to reverse every 22 years. This is the secret life of the magnetic sun. And this is the reason why the sun is so interesting and so dynamic. When we look at one of the sunspots uh, with a, this is a ground-based telescope uh, in high resolution, you see what is the umbra, which is the darkest part and then you have the penumbra. And by the way, um, around the sunspots, uh, these blobby structures are called granules. They are, they are indicative of convection, and each one is about the size of, let's say, California or Texas or Germany, huge things, but they only last 10 or 20 minutes. That's how dynamic the sun is. And because we can measure the magnetic fields um, with the technique I just mentioned, we find that in the penumbra, uh, the magnetic field is about 0.1 to 0.2 Tesla, and in the umbra is about 0.3, maybe 0.4 or 5 Tesla. And by Tesla, I don't mean that uh, you can have a three umbra to buy a Model X. That's not what I mean at all, uh, even though it's all attractive. Um, 
uh, it's a unit of the strength of the magnetic field. And to give you an idea of how strong these fields are, um, these are the field strengths that you would typically have in a magnetic resonance imaging machine. And you know, you're not supposed to have uh, metallic materials on your body when you go to one of these MRI scans because the magnetic field is so strong they will rip things out. So sunspots are like planet-sized MRI machines. Think of it that way. Extremely strong magnetic fields. And if you have the chance to see the Skylab out in the space hall, um, I encourage you to do so because uh, other, than, other than a lot of uh, experiments and giving a lot of astronauts uh, experience with living in space, uh, Skylab was special for solar physicists because of the Apollo telescope mount. The Apollo telescope mount had, I think, maybe seven or eight solar telescopes that were pointing at the sun free from the absorption in the Earth's atmosphere, free from seeing. And at that time, it was one of the golden ages of solar physics. Uh, you had literally astronauts uh, doing spacewalks to change the film. Uh, they were having uh, telecons with the scientists on the ground uh, deciding which part of the sun to measure. And a lot was learned from Skylab. For example, this is a UV image of an erupting prominence from Skylab. Now, uh, some of you uh, keen-eyed might have seen that in the eclipse image, there were some red dots uh, hovering above the limb of the moon and the sun. Uh, those are prominences, which are material that is suspended, now we know, by the magnetic field uh, in, the, in the sun's atmosphere. And sometimes they erupt. And so this was a spectacular observation from Skylab. Okay, so before I continue, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, you understand what I mean by uh, hot plasma. Okay, uh, not about our body. Uh, plasma is so-called the fourth state of matter. Basically, when you have atoms that are in such a hot environment that the electrons from the atoms can be stripped off and the electrons are floating in a sea, or they, they form a sort of a sea of electrons and and the, the ions, the, the ionized atoms, uh, they, they, are, they, they are suspended in this sea of electrons. And when you have this type of material, um, the electrically charged electrons and ions, they feel the magnetic field. So when you have strong magnetic fields moving, they would drag the plasma along, and when the plasma moves, they could stretch, they could bend the magnetic field uh, just like if it were string or better rubber bands. So based on the experience from Skylab and other observations, uh, I'm, I'm condensing the history dramatically here. We have, in the last 10 years, the Solar Dynamics Observatory to constantly monitor the sun uh, because we know how important it is uh, what happens on the sun affects us. So this is a video that NASA just released today.
So you notice the images look pretty good even on an IMAX screen. <laughs> and, and that's because even though the, the satellite was launched in 2010, uh, two of the instruments already had 4K by 4K uh, CCDs, so 16 megapixel images. And uh, these instruments were taking basically images of the sun every second. So yeah, like imagine uh, taking with a 60 megapixel camera an image every second uh, continuously. Actually, because of several cameras, it's more than one image per second, but continuously for 10 years. This is what SDO has done. And we get uh, data like this. So there are images of Uh, magnetic maps here from the helioseismic and magnetic imager using the technique I described before. Um, but because we can measure the shape and the shifts of spectral lines, we can also make so-called Doppler grams. So using the Doppler effect, such that when things are in motion, the frequency of waves uh, shift a little. Um, here, where there is red, basically it means that the sun is rotating away from us. That part of the sun is rotating away from us. And this part of the sun is uh, rotating towards us. So that's the signature of the rotation uh, due to the Doppler shift. But this gives us much more than that. There are little bubbles, little structures on the surface here. Um, this is from the convective flows uh, causing, causing waves to propagate all over the sun. And so our colleagues use a technique called helioseismology to probe the interior of the sun. And this is how we know uh, how the sun rotates inside and what is this interior structure. Okay, so this is a white light image. Um, these images are of the upper atmosphere of the sun from the atmospheric imaging assembly. I will talk about that later. In the middle panel, um, that is from the extreme UV variability experiment, which measures a spectrum um, at extreme ultraviolet wavelengths. Out extreme ultraviolet wavelengths typically means that the, the wavelength that we're measuring is sort of maybe a factor of 10 smaller than what our eyes can sense. And so, so here it's not doing much. It's just sort of, you know, wobbling a little bit. Um, but that's when the sun is quiet. When the sun has temper, temper tantrums. Uh, it does this. And this is one of the more spectacular eruptions that we have seen. As I said, because there is plasma and because there are strong magnetic fields spreading the plasma, um, if, if, you're, if you have magnets and you're sort of uh, playing mahjong with it and you're pushing things around, at some point, some of the tiles want to flip. And so when you squeeze the magnetic field, on the sun, sometimes the magnetic field also wants to abruptly reconfigure, and that releases a lot of energy. Uh, the magnetic fields uh, accelerate the material out into space, but not everything escapes. Some of it falls back down. So, so that's a solar eruption. And we can create artificial eclipses by having telescopes that have an occulting disk in the middle to, to cover the bright sun. And this is what is on the solar and heliospheric observatory. Um, that's still operating, it's already several decades. And so you can create artificial eclipses and you can track what the higher corona does. And you find that when there are big eruptions, there are things that almost look like light bulbs shooting off the sun. That the bright points are moving in the back uh, either planets or, or comets flying into the sun. Um, but you see these big light bulbs pinching off, and these are the coronal mass ejections which shoot out into interplanetary space. And what we also know is that the sun has a solar wind, and it's blowing from the sun all over throughout the solar system. The Earth is bathed in this wind. Uh, currents of magnetized particles moving at hundreds of kilometers per hour. But fortunately, the sun has its own magnetic field. 
And so it acts as a shield. Most of the time, it's pretty effective. But sometimes, this is a computer simulation. When there is a coronal mass ejection uh, headed towards Earth, um, the coronal mass ejection has, has magnetized material, magnetic fields that are hitting the Earth. And if it's aligned in a certain way, then it could disrupt the Earth's magnetic field, uh, pull its magneto tail, and then release again. And when that happens, you have geomagnetic storms. You have the magnetic field on the Earth shaking so much that um, from Faraday's law, we know that uh, when you have magnets that you bring towards a circuit loop or away, it generates an electromotive force causes a current. So uh, when we have geomagnetic storms, we can have impacts on the electrical power grid on large swaths of North America, for example. So coronal mass ejections can do that to us. And so there are cases when, when there's a transformer damage causing power blackouts uh, because of uh, the effects of geomagnetic storms. This is one manifestation of what we call space weather. Aurora is another. But there's another manifestation. Uh, during eruptions, you get flares. And flares are an abrupt increase of the, the radiation, especially in x-rays and in uh, ultraviolet radiation, um, many times, orders of magnitude above the background. When that happens, uh, this radiation is absorbed in the upper atmosphere. It impacts the ionosphere. And when the ionosphere is disrupted, uh, it can cause radio blackouts. So uh, NOAA, the weather agency, um, is not interested just about weather uh, that we're familiar with, but also space weather. And so uh, solar flares is another cause of uh, a space weather effect where we have disruptions in radio communication. And that matters for aviation. For example, uh, you, you want the, the, the planes need to be able to maintain constant radio communication. And, and if there is a risk that um, you cannot do that, they, they might fly a different route, uh, especially in the northern regions. Uh, for example, if you fly from, uh, from California to Europe, uh, you would go pretty high far north, um, but they, the, the airlines pay attention to, to solar flares. And then um, in 2017, we had two of the biggest flares of the current solar cycle. And that happened when Hurricane Irma was passing through the Caribbean and Florida. And so just as there was the need for uh, emergency help and, and evacuations using amateur radio. Um, radio communications was, were disrupted for three hours because of the solar flare, the strong solar flare. So it was, in a sense, a perfect storm. OK. So from the measurements that we have from missions like the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, from what we learn about the solar corona and the solar surface, uh, we can start to build numerical models trying to understand the physics of what drives solar flares. And so this is a video that we made uh, for one of the papers we published where we carried out so-called magnetohydrodynamic simulations. Uh, and magnetohydrodynamics is like hydro simulations, fluid simulations, except that you are coupling the evolution of the magnetic field and the plasma. As I was saying before, the plasma drags the magnetic field. The magnetic field has a back reaction on the plasma. So this is what we capture. And I will just let the video explain itself. just happened. 
Let's take a look at the life cycle of a solar flare. This is our sun. Magnetic loops above sunspots trap and heat plasma up to a few million kelvins. When magnetic fields are pressed together, they can snap and form new loops, a process called magnetic reconnection. Magnetic energy is released rapidly, heating plasma in the sun's atmosphere to much hotter temperatures. At the same time, magnetic forces eject plasma away from the sun. Like metallic rods, coronal loops are efficient conductors of heat. Energy conducted to the base of the corona launches fountains of hot plasma into magnetic loops. The magnetic loops, now filled with hot plasma, emit profuse quantities of X-rays and extreme ultraviolet radiation. Eventually, the solar flare subsides, the hot plasma clouds cool, condense, and fall. This is called coronal rain. Let's see it again. So I want to acknowledge uh, our uh, narrator, colleague uh, Mark De Rosa, who did a great job, and our colleague uh, George Chinzoglu, who composed the music for this video. Talented guy. Okay, so so we get light from the sun. I haven't really talked about this much, but basically, when you get an eruption, a coronal mass ejection that is forming. Um, there is a shock that, that propagates out from the source region. And that shock can accelerate particles to near uh, the speed of light sometimes. Uh, so you get these particle storms that come from solar eruptions. And this is what is the most threatening for our astronauts. If you have a big solar eruption, uh, it is modeled, it is uh, predicted that um, if an astronaut just happens to be in the wrong place where the magnetic field from the sun is, is uh, going through where the astronaut is, um, the dosage that is allowed in the blood forming organs uh, that uh, the astronaut would be uh, subject to uh, would be reached within half an hour. So, so that is that I think for a 30 day limit. So, so definitely if we're going to have human exploration in deep space, uh, we need to figure out a way to know precisely and how uh, solar eruptions occur and what to do with it. And these are unsolved problems. And then you get the magnetized wind, the solar wind and the ejections. There's another reason we like to study the sun. By the way, one of the reasons for me is that it's really beautiful. Um, but this is the Venus transiting the sun. And it's one of the rare instances that we can see a planet transiting a star, and we can see it in detail. And we care about planets transiting other stars because the Kepler mission NASA's Kepler mission has been looking at the little dips 
in the lights of other stars uh, for detecting planets around them. And uh, it's amazing that uh, uh, now, you know, 10 years ago, ex extrasolar planets were a rare thing, but now uh, more than 4,000 have been discovered. And so that begs the question, um, are these planets habitable? Uh, this is a beautiful rendering of the different uh, exoplanetary systems, not all of them here in this one shot, that Kepler has discovered. And the color coding of the, the planets uh, shows um, what is the predicted surface temperature of the planet if it's in equilibrium. So based on the distance from the star and, and the radiative output of the star, uh, what would be the temperature? And typically when we want something that is in the habitable zone, uh, we want planets where the surface temperature allows for liquid water. That's what people mean by habitable zone. But is it a sufficient criterion? From what you've just learned about space weather, um, you can imagine if the Earth were much closer to our star, and if our star were much more active, then perhaps space weather would make it difficult for life to thrive. And so that's one of the uh, big thrusts of research these days, is to combine what we know about space weather and exoplanets and astrobiology to find the criteria, the bounds that uh, would be uh, suitable for life. And, and space weather from the star plays a big role, potentially plays a big role. Especially since uh, some stars rotate much faster than the sun and because of that, they tend to have stronger magnetic fields. So what we learn about our star matters for discovering our place in the universe. I'd like to spend the remainder of my time talking about the exciting observatories and missions that will transform what we know about the sun. And there are still many things we don't know. Uh, with SDO and with uh, other missions like Hinode and Iris that I haven't had a chance to talk about, uh, we've learned a lot about how the magnetic field evolves. We've come up with models, but there's a lot of the sun that we still don't know, and we're not at a predictive, a, a reliably predictive capability of space weather just yet. But even beyond that, uh, learning about the basic plasma physics that's happening on the sun uh, is relevant for understanding what happens in the rest of the universe. So, the Inoue Solar Telescope um, had its first light in December, and they released the first pictures. Um, this is a four-meter primary, uh, this is a telescope with a four-meter primary mirror on Haleakala. It's the most advanced and biggest solar telescope that we have, um, uh, funded by the NSF, and it's amazing. So this is the first light image of the surface granules, the granulation patterns uh, on the sun from uh, the Inoue Solar Telescope. Um, you can see a map of the, the US here for scale. So yeah, each of these is a big state. And look in detail, in between the cells, there are these bright points, bright ribbons, and these are actually regions of magnetic field also, except they're not as strong as the magnetic fields in sunspots. Um, they can still be buffeted by the convective flows. But uh, these regions have been discovered and reported and studied in the past, but not at uh, this exquisite detail. But even though this looks extremely impressive, you ain't seen nothing yet because because it, remember, when we want to measure the details of the solar atmosphere, especially its magnetic field, 
we actually want to measure certain properties of light, how polarized it is. And it's in this polarized light that we can find out a lot about the magnetic structures, how these magnetic bundles might be spun up, how they might generate waves, how the waves might dissipate to heat the corona. Um, so when we get polarized images and spectra from DKIS, that's when the fun really begins. And we're all very excited. We're very excited about Parker Solar Probe. Our word about uh, Parker. So in 1958, Eugene Parker, professor at Chicago, demonstrated that a multi-million degree corona, solar corona, necessarily causes an outward flow, which is now called the solar wind. That was the beginning of space plasma physics. And this is an introduction to a journal issue, and the, the Astrophysical Journal, that was just published on February 3rd, uh, with 50 papers on new results from the Parker Solar Probe. And it was written by Marsha Nogabao, one of the pioneers of the field of space plasma physics. I mean, it's fine that he, uh, he came up with a theory to predict solar wind, but it means little if no one would dare to confirm it. And she did so beautifully with the data from the Mariner 2 spacecraft uh, in 1962. But what Parker is designed to do is to get as close to the sun as it is reasonably possible. Uh, it, will, it will fly into a more and more uh, smaller orbit and it will get eventually very close, and I'll tell you how close later. One of the early discoveries is that when it measures the magnetic field in space locally, um, it's not, we're not talking about images of the sun, but when it's going through interstellar space, it measures the magnetic field and the particles, it finds that there are actually uh, large deviations of the magnetic field direction, very sudden, and then reversal back. So these are called switchbacks. And, and this was a surprise to, to people who study the solar wind. Um, where does it come from? Maybe it comes from little small magnetic fields that are on the surface of the sun, uh, causing magnetic reconnection, causing jets. Uh, we don't know. But that's why we need to have both DKIST and uh, Parker Solar Probe. And you also, of course, need the Solar Dynamics Observatory to complete the picture. But we're learning about how the solar wind is generating, how the sun loses its mass. And in losing its mass, it's losing also its angular momentum. And when it loses its angular momentum, a star spins down. And it's important for us to understand how stars spin down because we want to know how active other stars are and if they're spinning faster, they're more active, and it might not be uh, good for life. So we really want to know the history of uh, angular momentum evolution in stars. So that's, one, that's another reason why Parker's probe is so important. Eventually, you'll get this close to the sun. So it's not right there, like some pictures show you, but it's close enough that it really, really probes the higher corona of the sun. And then, Yesterday, uh, we celebrated the launch of Solar Orbiter. The Solar Orbiter will also get sort of close, not, not 10 solar radii, but up to 30 solar radii, I think. Um, but the most special thing about Solar Orbiter is that it will go out of the plane, the ecliptic, uh, where the planets are circling the sun. So using a series of uh, slingshot maneuvers, Using, no Siri, uh, using a series of slingshot maneuvers from Venus, it will eventually have an orbit that is inclined from the ecliptic so that we can look down at the northern poles of the sun and the southern poles of the sun. And these are regions that we have not measured very well because it is hard. Even though the sun's axis is tilted by about seven degrees so that every now and then we see a little bit we don't measure the magnetic fields 
in the polar regions of the sun very well. And that matters. That matters because it affects our models of the solar cycle. It matters because uh, the, the solar wind coming from those polar regions have a large impact. They shape the heliosphere, uh, affects our models of how coronal mass ejections might propagate. Uh, so it has huge importance uh, that we can measure the poles from above and below. So you, in one way or another, you've seen different images from the Solar Dynamics Observatory uh, in different colors. And the different colors, are th these are false colors because most of these are not visible. Um, they show different things. Uh, we pick different wavelengths so that they show emission from atoms, like iron atoms, that are like 18 times ionized. They lost 18 electrons. But they lost 18 electrons because um, it's in plasma that is like 10 million Kelvin hot, very hot plasma. And when we see the solar corona at different temperatures, we find that it is very, very much structured, looks different from one wavelength to another. Um, and combining all this, we can have accurate measures of the temperature distribution and the mass distribution in the corona and study how uh, corona heating occurs. And so there's been a lot of work in that. And to end, I will again shut up and let you enjoy this video. The sun in a new light. When a new dawn comes, what will we see? So thank you. That was um, really amazing and fascinating. And I can't agree with you more. I mean, to me, more than anything else, the sun is just amazingly beautiful. It's so, I could sit and look at these images all night. But instead, we have time for questions. And tonight, the questions are going to be moderated by our space history curator, Dr. David Dvorkin. David, come on up. Okay. Yep. I'm 
just trying to figure out how to turn this on. There we go. Okay, we'll resume our positions, and I see some hands right here. Oh, um, we have microphones on either side. Okay, the question is, how do you protect your satellites from micrometeorites, correct? Yes. Okay. So that's a good question. I, I don't know if I have a good answer. Uh, we try to have designs that mitigate uh, the effects of micrometeorites. Uh, for example, in the atmospheric imaging assembly, uh, there, there are filters that are at the front of the telescope as well as uh, near the focal plane. And so even though the front filters can have these little pinholes from micrometeorites, um, uh, because most of the light, the visible light is still blocked by the focal plane filter, we still get these uh, EUV images. Um, but uh, over, as the, as the telescope has been aging, when we do uh, look at the, at least for the atmospheric imaging assembly, the visible light channel, um, we can clearly see the effect of micrometeorites. So, uh, again, if you have questions, uh, I think we have a microphone over here. And is there one over there as well? Yeah, okay, but uh, uh, those of you can do that, but I can take, if you can yell. I will do my best. That's pretty uh, good. What I want to know is the images that you showed us, some of them I think I can find at NASA, but can I find the images of the auroras that you showed us? So the question is, where would we go on the web, I assume, uh, to find some of this incredible imagery? Uh, is, it, is it available? Huh. So um, first of all, um, at least uh, in NASA heliophysics, and I think it's true of the other divisions too, the data, all the heliophysics data is publicly available. So, so any one of us could in principle download the data and analyze it like a uh, scientist would, and there are opportunities to be involved. Um, but if you just want images, then obviously uh, there's a lot of uh, images available from the Solar Dynamics Observatory website. Uh, some of the movies I use are from the Scientific Visualization Studio at Goddard. Um, the Aurora image I found uh, with a Creative Commons license somewhere. Um, but if you are looking for a uh, fantastic talk about what we know about auroras and the history of auroras, then I would recommend you consult a documentary by my colleague uh, Paul Brecker, uh, B-R-E-K-K-E. -E. He's the world's expert on, on auroras. Well, I think you do pretty good by just watching the webcast of this show. <laughs> Her friend is a scientist, she's an artist, and somehow they talk to each other. <laughs> is anybody going to go to the mics there? They're all uh, much more available, but I'll, I'll keep taking. Uh, yeah, right there. What did you learn from that solar eruption from June 2011, that incredible eruption? Uh, okay, so there are lots of eruptions on the sun, and I have to make sure I'm not confusing some of them. But from, from the solar dynamics observatory in general, from the lots of eruptions that we have seen, uh, what we discover is that um, we now are able to to follow the formation of, uh, of magnetic flux ropes that are hovering uh, in the solar corona um, outside of active regions. We can track them. They actually look like a cavity in the corona, and so people can follow them. Um, we also find that 
they somehow have some sort of resonance properties that they oscillate with some wavelength, um, probably, probably like a slinky that you just sort of bang. Um, there are so-called like a solar tornadoes, which are like prominence materials that are like trees that are connecting to, to the bottoms of the cavities and, and they look like they have some spinning motion or at least some shearing motion. And then we also find that uh, when one prominence erupts, it could disrupt the whole uh, global corona so much that it might destabilize another one. So you can have uh, so-called sympathetic eruptions. Um, so th those are eruptions from prominences uh, away from active regions, so from the remnants of active regions. Um, but then there are stronger eruptions that are from the sunspot groups themselves. And we're learning how the magnetic fields are being twisted to a certain point until they reach some sort of instability. Um, we're still not good at data driven models and data simulation models like the earth weather people are in order to predict it yet. Partly because of the, the data is still different than what we have here, not, not enough, but partly it's just, uh, you know, in the large scheme of things, this is still reasons work. People are starting because of, because of the availability of uh, data that is uh, of a uh, uniform quality in space so that we can actually try to use numerical codes for them. Uh, brief question before we go over there and then over there. Uh, I have a question. Does this uh, lead to or make uh, predictive models more powerful? Uh, through the lessons you learn? Yes, the lessons you learn. Uh, yes, so, so uh, one thing that uh, people have learned to do is they, they look at some theories of uh, magnetic instability. Um, for, and they find that um, if you had a flux rope suspended in the corona and there is some bootstrapping field, the, so, so you think of magnetic field as like, a, as like a rubber bands or, or you know, uh, half-cooked spaghetti. It has tension, so, so it, it, you know, it, it sort of confines things. Um, depending on how the strapping field, uh, the strength of the strap, bootstrapping field uh, weakens with height, then it makes it easier or harder for the flux rope to erupt or to be confined, even though it's, erupt, it's trying to erupt. So, so in that sense, people are better at it. What we're not good at is to predict once there's an eruption, what time uh, a coronal mass ejection might arrive at Earth, or even if it's really uh, have a straight on impact or a glancing impact. And if it is an impact, um, whether the magnetic field is pointed northward or southward. Um, if it's pointed southward, it's coming towards the Earth, then there's a bigger uh, impact, a uh, bigger geomagnetic storm. So we're not good at that. Uh, because there's so few observations in between the Earth and the Sun, we have satellites at um, Lagrangian point one, which is the gravitational balance point between the Sun and the Earth. But it's like only um, in, like a million miles from the Earth, whereas we're like a um, hundred million miles away from the sun. Thank you. Now we have some questions. Over here, we'll Unfortunately, start. Unfortunately, you just asked my question about uh, predictability, so oh, I'm sorry. I'll turn it over to this fellow. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I put him up to that. Can't, can't you do that? Any, you can certainly do it better than I did. <laughs> so my question is, what causes the solar cycle, and why is it 11 years? Ah, so that's a that's a good question. There are um, so th there are different theories of the solar cycle, but I would say all of them have to do with the fact that the sun is spinning, but not spinning as a solid body. It is uh, spinning so that the equator is spinning faster, and the uh, and the higher latitude regions are spinning slower. And when that happens, um, there is this shear in the plasma velocity in the interior of the sun, and that's stretching the magnetic field. So it's like stretching the rubber band. And when you stretch the magnetic field, it becomes stronger. You create these toroidal, these torus, tori, donuts of magnetic field inside the solar interior. And some of it escape, they're, they're buoyant and escape to the surface. 
And um, because of the Coriolis effect, which we also have on Earth, um, they get tilted. And because they're tilted, um, there tends to be some magnetic field of a polarity that is uh, towards the North Pole in one hemisphere and towards the South Pole in the other hemisphere. And that gets diffused away and it goes towards the poles. And, and that will cancel any existing polarity that the poles have. And that would, ref that would cancel it and then eventually reverse it. Um, but, but we don't have good predictive models of how this happens. And that's because we don't have good models of turbulence. Uh, turbulence is a very hard problem. Magneto, mag magnetic turbulence is uh, even harder. Um, so, so a lot of the models have free parameters or they have to tune things so that things look sort of like the sun. And at the moment, our best predictor for how strong the next sunspot cycle is is actually how much flux there is in the polar regions of the sun when the sun is at its minimum, when there's few, few sunspots. Uh, that's our best predictor. But that, that only gives us a few years of, uh, of lead time. Um, and people can't predict very well uh, what that minimum level is yet. That's why it's so important to have things like solar orbiter to, to measure the magnetic field properly and the flows properly near the polar regions. Why is it 11 years has to do with, okay, uh, yeah, I was explaining the entire solar dynamo theory. Okay, so. Um, you, you have the, 11 years. The, not only is the sun rotating differentially, but there's also flows from the equator towards the poles. And so in these models, typically it is the amount of time that it takes for, for the, the meridional circulation uh, to, to, give, uh, to, 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 to carry and affect the flux to cancel the flux. But again, none of these dynamos that, that, gen, that, that I try to model this self-consistently get the solar cycle right. So I think we don't have a final answer. Not yet. Question over here. <clears throat> um, I uh, apologize in advance for my lack of uh, physics terminology. My field is actually in medicine. But the slide of the solar magnetic um, influence in, in the generators in Africa was very memorable for me. So that got me thinking how much of an impact or influence do the solar flares or solar winds um, more importantly, like the solar climate have an influence with our planet's climate? Um, and is there even a relationship between the cyclical patterns of those solar flares um, and um, climate change that we're experiencing currently? Uh, you repeat the question? Or no, it's not, he, he, okay, everybody can hear. So, um, so the, the, the light emitted in in the extreme ultraviolet and X-rays, that, 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 that wavelength, um, that increases so much during solar flares, that is a minuscule fraction, orders of magnitude smaller than the radiation, the energy that we get from the sun in the visible and the infrared. Uh, so, so while they change a lot, it is a tiny fraction that, that uh, changes, we think, only the upper atmosphere um, in, um, what it does is that if it gets absorbed in the upper atmosphere, it breathes out and then that increases drag on satellites. So it, it affects it that way. Um, the between solar maximum and solar minimum in a cycle, uh, I think the change in the solar irradiance is about 0.1%. And even though, even though sunspots are darker, the stuff around the sunspots are actually brighter. So that's why it's actually more radiation that we see uh, during solar maximum. Uh, but, but that's it. And from the literature of the studies I know, um, the variation of the sun's activity is not enough to, to explain uh, the global warming that we have. Uh, quite, okay, question over here. 
So it was quite striking that the solar prominences are only visible in the UV. I hadn't appreciated that before. In the visible, you really couldn't see them. Uh, actually, so the, the solar prominences you can see in the, in the visible also. Um, so, so they're reddish color. Um, they, they're meeting in a specific spectral line, but it's quite hard to see them. You, you sort of rely, if you don't have an artificial eclipse, like a coronagraph, you rely on just like at the beginning of totality and, and at the end of totality to be able to see them. Because otherwise, the moon is just a little bit big enough to obscure them. My question was, you mentioned that uh, someone had originally seen, a, uh, a, I think, a coronal mass ejection. And then it correlated with uh, changes in the magnetic field measured here on Earth. Why was it visible at that time? Is it because there's always some visible signature? Uh, so he saw a flare, but not, but not a prominent ejection. Um, so so there, there, were, there were brightenings. It was a so-called white light flare. And so there were, there were brightenings and, and ribbon-shaped things on the surface, but it wasn't a direct observation of the ejection. You're, you're thinking of Carrington in 1859. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Question over here. What um, has uh, um, the current research that you've uh, been discussing tonight uh, as to the um, uh, activity at the sun's surface told us about the engine that's driving all of this deep in the, inside the sun? Have we been able to model that in any way? And uh, uh, are there plans in the future to, uh, to do more experimental uh, work to try to get a handle on that? Uh, so there's actually, um, so, so in the core of the sun, which is uh, 15 million Kelvin, um, that's where the fusion is happening. And, and we don't directly uh, probe that easily or, or know what's going on. Um, we have models, and we have the neutrino measurements to give us a picture. Um, but that doesn't tell us how it's evolving. Um, but the big overlap um, in terms of the fusion community and the solar physics community is when it comes to magnetic fields, uh, because magnetic fields can be used to confine plasmas. So um, when we understand um, when magnetic fields connect, when there are uh, magnetic instabilities, uh, we can better control um, how we confine plasmas. And so, so there's a lot of conferences where uh, people will talk about uh, fusion devices and, and solar physics. Okay, one more question over here. Hello. Uh, so my question is regarding um, human space exploration in the future, um, probably close to the sun, uh, where you kind of told um, that um, how we do not have a way to kind of prevent ourselves from experiencing uh, the solar storm, as per se, like, like how it would affect the human body. Um, is there any research done or is there research that's happening currently that uh, possibly replicating a human's magnetic field that currently helps, uh, not human, I meant uh, the, the Earth's magnetic field that's currently helping the Earth to survive and thrive that could possibly, you know, used in possibly a bodysuit uh, that could help us? Uh, so I, I know of, um, so, th so th th there are ways to try to shield ourselves. And for example, if you're on the moon, and people think about like whether you can have robots or build structures that are thick enough to, to shield ourselves. It's, it's harder if you're trying to hull uh, all your supplies uh, towards Mars. Um, I, and I've heard of ideas of uh, you know, generating a magnetosphere to protect one, but I haven't seen that in practice. There's but it might be just, I, I don't know. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Uh, we've had a wonderful evening. I just have a few closing remarks. Thank you for joining us. I just wanted to mention we have three more Exploring Space lectures this spring, including discussions about the Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, which is retiring this month. Uh, the simple question, when did the universe begin? Because there's, a, there's actually an ongoing debate about that now. And then finally, the Event Horizon Telescope's astonishing image of a black hole. 
We finally found one. And we'll see those in the coming months. And then this summer, uh, David LaCrone uh, from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center will celebrate 30 years of exploring the universe with the Hubble Space Telescope. And this will be at our annual John Bacall Lecture uh, that we will uh, be holding this, uh, this summer. Uh, please visit our website to uh, obtain free tickets, first come, first serve, as you know. And I guess this is about all the time we have for tonight. Uh, I'd like to once again thank our sponsors, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne, United, United Launch Alliance, for their very, very kind support these past years uh, for this lecture series. Now please exit uh, through the back doors here. Um, and uh, uh, if you'd like to speak to Dr. Chung, um, he will be at the Welcome Center on the first floor, but we do have to vacate uh, uh, this room. Thank you very much.